Well, I invite you to open your Bibles to Mark 10 this evening. Mark 10, as we continue our study in this wonderful gospel, we're coming to an important portion of Scripture here this evening and in the opportunities that follow to be in Mark, or after Jesus has established before His disciples the cross and continued to clarify His call to discipleship, His call to self-examination, to repentance, to being changed by the Word of God. In these next three portions of Mark, we find Jesus' authority extends to all portions of our lives. It, is, it extends to marriage, it extends to children, and it extends even to possessions. And it's not accidental the way that Mark has arranged this gospel. So let's read this evening, beginning in Mark 10, beginning in verse 1. We'll read through verse 12, which is our passage for this evening. And he left there and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Well, the theme for this evening is that Jesus has authority over the family. Jesus has authority over the family. And obviously, the foundational building block of the family is the marriage relationship. And so again, we're finding that following Christ, being a disciple of Christ, deals with every area in your life, including the closest personal relationship that there is on earth, that of a husband and wife. It's important for us to remember what is happening throughout this gospel. Back in chapter 1, in verses 14 and 15, Mark introduced what Jesus was doing, what his ministry was about. And his ministry was a preaching ministry. And he was preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand and that to enter the kingdom of God, to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, to come under the authority of the king, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. The conditions to enter the kingdom of God are to acknowledge that you are a sinner and to turn away from your sin and to believe the good news of forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. And every 
interaction that Mark records as he goes through the gospel fills out this message and helps us understand the fact that we all must repent and believe the gospel. And when we come to the closest of human relationships, we realize we need to repent and believe the gospel. We need to bring ourselves under the authority of the king and repent for our sinful, self-centered way of living, our sinful, self-centered way of viewing marriage and receive the forgiveness that is in Christ Jesus. And that forgiveness extends to all, regardless of what your past might have looked like, regardless of the kind of sinful decisions and the, and the consequences of those decisions, right? The, the invitation and the necessity for all to repent is freely offered, and forgiveness is freely given. And I start with that just because pastorally, when you come to a passage like this, you're well aware that those who are listening, there's a full spectrum of background represented. And so I begin by encouraging you and edifying us tonight with the reality that the forgiveness that you have in Christ, regardless of the sinful choices of the past, as you come to Christ, the forgiveness is full and free. The redemption is complete, and you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ as one who has trusted in Christ. And now Christ calls you to follow him. Christ rules over the institution of the family, and being a disciple of Christ means submitting to the king within the family. If you think back to the initial call to discipleship at the end of chapter 8, to be a disciple of Christ, you deny yourself and you take up your cross and you follow Jesus... Following Christ, then, means renouncing self-sovereignty over God's institution of marriage. It means following that, that following Christ will mean being willing to receive and endure suffering to honor Christ in the marriage relationship. Right? And I say that and I immediately think of many over the years that I've had the joy of ministering to, many who are in hard marriages and yet, by God's grace, have obeyed and endured because they brought themselves under the authority of Christ. They want to honor Christ more than find their own happiness. And following Christ means a reorientation of your life to Christ and not to what you think will make you happy which so often is the basis for the conflicts of, in marriage. This passage records Jesus' interaction with those who were attempting to undermine his authority. In verse 1, we find that Jesus is teaching in the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. It's on his way from Galilee to Jerusalem, so kind of in that middle area likely on the east side of the Jordan River. He's teaching these crowds. He's teaching with authority. The Scriptures say this time and time again. He's, he is authoritative in his declarations because he is the king. And the whole context of this discussion in verse 2 is that the Pharisees, the religious leaders who dislike him, who according to chapter 3, verse 6, they're already set on destroying him, they come to him, and in order to test him, they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And so the context is an interaction with those who are attempting to undermine Jesus' authority by introducing this question, on what grounds 
is divorce allowable, is essentially what they're asking. I'll explain more about that in a little bit. But they're attacking Jesus' authority by attacking the institution of marriage. And every deviation, every deviation from God's design for marriage attacks Jesus' authority. Marriage is important in the kingdom of God, and kingdom citizens view it the way their king views it. It's instructive for us that Mark places this account about marriage immediately following a discussion about stumbling blocks, repentance, and allowing God's word to change you. Because marriage is a crucible for all of those things. For those of you who are not yet married, here is your hint to prepare about for marriage. Learn how to examine yourself, learn how to repent, and learn how to allow God's word to change you. Then you're getting ready for marriage. Matthew places this discussion immediately following Jesus' parable about the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. The unforgiving servant is in Matthew 18, and then this discussion follows in Matthew 19. And again, I would say marriage is a crucible for forgiveness. So how do you prepare for marriage? Learn to examine yourself Learn to repent, learn to allow God's word to change you, and learn how to extend forgiveness in the same way that Christ has forgiven you. Now you're getting ready for marriage. Marriages will have problems, and we'll see why here in just a moment. It's inevitable, they will have problems. (laughs) Very quickly, Very quickly, you know, this idea of, oh, we were made for each other becomes like, yeah, we were made for each other like a match was made for gasoline. The answer to problems is not to get out. The answer is to accept God's design and humbly practice repentance and forgiveness. You know, we say that we do a lot of counseling from the pulpit, and in the opportunities that I've had to spend with couples over, I don't know, close to 20 years, I guess, off and on, and help couples with with their marriages, pretty much, and you know, I'm not going to say always because there's... There might be an exception that I'm missing, but pretty much the problems in marriages boil down to an issue of repentance and forgiveness. And I'm not dismissing situations and the complexities where you have a saved and unsaved spouse. I'm not dismissing that, but generally speaking, when you have two people seeking to follow the Lord, problems usually come down to an issue of two people being self-centered and being unwilling to repent or extend forgiveness. Make no mistake that marriage, according to Christ, marriage the way God designed it, marriage in a way that honors the Lord, that brings glory to God, It does require being in Christ. And if we're ultimately going to be successful in our marriages in a way that that God designed, you're not going to be able to do that by self-discipline. You're not going to be able to do that by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and just trying harder. It ultimately boils down to being in Christ to allowing the character of Christ 
to be assimilated into your own mind and life as you are changed from one degree of glory to another, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And it's as we depend on the riches and the abundance of what we have in Christ that we, by His grace, are able to operate as kingdom citizens within the institution of marriage, no matter what that marriage looks like. Paul writes, He, Jesus, has become our sanctification. And as we're in Christ, we're sanctified even through the difficulties within the institution of marriage as we seek to follow Christ in marriage. So with those words of of introduction, we're going to consider the passage tonight in three simple points and just so you know, I'm, I'm not going to be handling the uh, exception clauses that are found in Matthew. For one reason, it's not in Mark. And I would refer you to a passage that Pastor Don, or the, a message that Pastor Don preached. Uh, I think it was on April uh, 10th of 2017, Jesus on Divorce. And you can find that uh, on Sermon Audio if you want a, a full exposition of how the exception clauses play into this with the very narrow exception of adultery being the only biblical grounds for divorce. And he fills that out. And it needs an extended message. And so I would refer you uh, to that. And of course, the, other, the one other exception being when an unbelieving spouse leaves a believing spouse according to 1 Corinthians 7. But again... Uh, Jesus on divorce from April of 2017 would be a message to to, uh, go back and listen to to fill that out. For our purposes this evening, three points. Point number one, God hates divorce. Point number two, God made marriage. And point number three, God determines consequences. God hates divorce. God made marriage. And God determines consequences. And my goal tonight is is simply to allow what Jesus does in this passage to stand. And what Jesus does in this passage is he answers the question of divorce by establishing God's intent for marriage. He answers the question about the grounds of divorce by establishing God's intent for marriage. And that's where we have to begin. We have to begin with God's design. We have to begin with God's intent. And so we're establishing that tonight. And any time... You know, I preach on a message like this or teach on a message like this. I'm also aware of those who have not yet been married, of the younger people in the room. And I appeal to you as we go through this passage, settle in your mind and in your heart now that by God's grace, you are, you are committed to following God's design for marriage that you're committed to submitting to your king, that you're committed to embracing all God says about marriage and divorce. So let's begin by considering the truth that God hates divorce. The Pharisees come up and they ask Jesus this question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And very likely the the implication is for any cause. And Matthew actually fills that out, states that specifically. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And, And they're coming to Jesus. Divorce is fairly easy in that context. And they're and they're wondering if, it's, if he's going to say, yeah, it's easy because they like it that way. And not only that, 
But this is a politically charged question. Jesus and the Pharisees, they're having this discussion actually in the area where Herod is ruling. What do we know about Herod? Who's he married to? Herodias. So folks, this this question is not just an innocent question. This is a politically charged question with potential lethal consequences. John already lost his head over this issue. They're trying to undermine Jesus. They're trying to get the king killed. They're trying to destroy him. And Jesus, of course, answers, well, what did Moses say? And they go to Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, and said, well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus responded to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. He does not back down, and we're going to just see in just a moment how this unfolds, but he does not back down from what is very clear in the last book even of our Old Testament in Malachi, God hates divorce. The reason there's a concession is because of the sinfulness of man's heart, not because God is endorsing uh, something destructive to the institution that he made. So I want to do a little exercise and, and, and give us some Old Testament background. Go, go to Genesis 3 to begin with. Genesis 3. Let's just think about what is at the root of divorce from the entrance of sin into the world. At the end of Genesis 2, the Lord created Eve for completing Adam. And the first human words in the Bible, the first human words that are recorded in the Bible are in chapter 2, verse 23, when the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It's instructive for us that the first human words recorded in the Bible are recorded from man and his innocence, from man without sin. And what is he doing? He's responding in gratitude to God. If you want a slice of what God-honoring speech looks like, it looks like responding in gratitude to God. But then the tragedy of chapter 3, where the serpent comes and deceives the woman and Adam and Eve, sin. And what happens, what happens as a result of that sin? Look at verse 16. To the woman, God says, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Right? We're all familiar with the first part of that verse, the pain that comes in childbearing. But there's a second part of the consequences to sin Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And what the Lord is saying is that the the marriage relationship, the one flesh union, has been disrupted by sin, and and the woman will have a desire to, to, to control her husband, to run things, and his response will be to be harsh and overbearing. And that's the introduction of conflict into the marriage. It comes as a direct result of the fall. That's why at the beginning I said, you know, you're going to have problems in marriage. Why? Well, because you're two sinners married. Right? There's a, a book someone wrote, what did you expect? And it's about marriage. What did you expect? And you see the nature of how this works out when you go back to verse 12, when, when Jesus is, 
or when God is addressing the man and woman after they've sinned, he's walking in the garden and asking questions, not because he doesn't know, but to reveal what's going on in the mind and heart of Adam and Eve. And when when God asked, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And then he turned to the woman and said, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And, you know, again, if you want a synopsis of what it looks like in marriage when there's problems, that's it. It's her fault. No, it's his fault. In fact, when someone comes, when one person comes and says, I need to talk about my marriage, you know, my spouse is really getting under my nerves. You know what my response to that is? Well, I'll be glad to talk to both of you, but in the meantime, let's talk about you. Right? We're not going to start pointing fingers. That, that's, that's a direct result of the fall. When we start pointing fingers, we're just following the pattern of Adam and Eve after they fell. Right? We're going to start by, by acknowledging our own sin and repenting of our own sin and taking responsibility for our own sin. That's where we start. But conflict in marriage is a direct result of the fall. And so when we go to Deuteronomy 24, go ahead and turn over to, the, to Deuteronomy 24. I'm skipping a lot of passages. If you read through Genesis, you won't find one really good marriage. You know, Abraham and Sarah, their marriage was pretty rough. You know, Sarah says, look, I can't have any children here. Take my maid. What? Abraham says, you know what, we're going to a foreign country. You're a very beautiful woman. I'm afraid that they might kill me. Yeah, let's say we're brother and sister and you go live with the king of the country. What? Right, yeah, I mean, it's just, you read through Genesis and Genesis is just a book of dysfunction. And it's that way on purpose because it's showing the dysfunction of sin and the need that we have for a redeemer right from the, right from the get-go. And you see all kinds of violence, all kinds of awful things as you, as you read through the Pentateuch. And so when, when God begins to form a nation, Israel, he encodes laws for the protection, for the protection of weaker people. And in this case, in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, what what we have is is a law about divorce for the protection of women who were often taken advantage of and treated just like pieces of property. And so this is what Deuteronomy 24 says, when a man takes a wife, beginning in verse 1, when a man takes a, a wife and marries her, and if he... If then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife... Then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. And basically what's happening is God is saying, look, if if you send a wife away, she has to have her certificate of divorce and and. This is to keep a man from saying, well, I'm going to divorce you, no, I'm going to marry you, no, I'm going to divorce you, back and forth. It's for her protection. And so that's what the Pharisees refer to when they say, well, Moses said, you know, just if you find an indecency in her, then 
you know, write a certificate of divorce and the paperwork's done and you're good to go. And we're going to talk about what they're thinking about that in a moment. But before we leave the Old Testament, I want to make it very clear that because God made this provision, his attitude toward divorce was not an endorsement. So go to the last book of your Old Testament, to the book of, Deut- or to the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. And the context is that God is saying, look, I don't, I don't accept your worship. I don't accept your worship. You can weep all you want. You can groan all you want, but I don't accept your worship. And in chapter 2, verse 14, we pick up, but you say, why does he not? And here's the answer. Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. And even in that passage, the Lord the Lord points to the inward attitude. You guard yourself in your spirit and do not be faithless. And we've just gone to those passages briefly to establish in the Old, Te- the Old Testament background for divorce. Conflict is in marriage because of the fall. So the conflict that brings divorce is directly related to the fall. That's where conflict started. The concession in Deuteronomy 24 is a concession for protection. But in Malachi chapter 2, you have the very clear condemnation of faithlessness. So then, going back to the New Testament, we've looked at the Old Testament background, so let's think now about the New Testament context. When the Pharisees come to Jesus, there in Mark 10, to test him, there's a lot happening. Within the Pharisees, you have two groups of people that view divorce differently and the grounds for divorce differently. Remember in Deuteronomy chapter 24, the grounds was for some kind of indecency. Well, one group, the Shammai group, said, well, that, that is adultery, and that's the only grounds for divorce. And then another group, the Halal group, said, no, 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 it's, it's, any, it's any indecency. It's anything that a husband doesn't like about his wife. I mean, it, it could be something that she can't cook, and she burned the chicken, and so now write a, write a certificate of divorce, I'm going to go marry somebody that can cook. Or it could be as frivolous of, oh, I found somebody prettier than you, so I'm going to write a bill of divorce. Right? So that was how the Hillel school interpreted that. They made it very easy to divorce and to remarry by doing what Peter says, watch out for people like this, by twisting the Word of God. So this is a, a controversial religious issue. You have groups that are vying for power and vying for authority, and they interpret things differently. And obviously, some people like that group and some people like that group. And with this question, they're trying to get Jesus to take sides and undermine his authority and and even his popularity with the crowds. 
And then as I mentioned, where this is taking place, it's taking place in a, in a place that's under Herod's rule. And so it's also a politically charged issue. John the Baptist has already lost his head because he took a stand. It's not lawful for you, Herod, to have your brother's wife. But not only that, within the New Testament context, we find that it is a personally devastating reality. Think about John 4. Who does Jesus talk to in John 4? He talks to a woman who's unsatisfied, and he offers her living water. But what does he say? Go call your husband. She says, I don't have one. He says, I know. You've had five. And the one you now have is not your husband. What was Jesus doing? He was ministering to a shattered, unsatisfied woman who had experienced the devastating reality of divorce, of adultery, and then also in John 8, you know, there's some discussion about that passage, but a woman caught in adultery comes or is brought to Jesus. You know, there's a lot of things you wonder about that passage, isn't there? Like, where was the guy? They didn't bring him. And Jesus addresses them and says, look, all right, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone, and they all start to go away. They get it. And then Jesus says to that woman, is there anyone left to condemn you? No, Lord, neither do I. Go and sin no more. You could also look at Luke 7, 36 through 50, where the where the prostitute comes to Jesus and cries and wipes her feet, wipes his feet with her hair. And Jesus says, she's been forgiven much and she loves much. Right? There's the personal, personally devastating reality sprinkled all through the New Testament, but it's in the context of Jesus extending kindness and compassion and healing and forgiveness. Nonetheless, it's devastating. It is a devastating reality. And so when Jesus responds to the Pharisees, he does not back down on the unchanging God's view of divorce. God hates divorce. And the, and the commandment that Moses gave was simply a concession because of your hard hearts because of your sinful hearts. It was a concession for protection. So he's changing the tenor of the, con of the conversation. The Pharisees have approached Jesus to undermine his authority based on their own casual view of marriage and divorce. It's just a debate about what the grounds are. Divorce is taken for granted. And if you approach marriage like that, Right? I mean, it's like, it's like you get a brand new gas stove. Oh, cool, a gas stove that can cook, you know, do whatever gas stoves do. I don't know. And you say, but I don't know how to work this thing. Well, let me go look at the instructions on the fire extinguisher. What? I mean, are you expecting it to blow up? This is designed to cook and to make good food. Not to be a disaster, you don't start with the fire extinguisher. And when you approach marriage through the lens of divorce, you're doing the same thing. And so Jesus turns the question. It's not, it's not an issue of, of debating, well, why can you divorce and what constitutes a, a reason for divorce? No, let's, let's go and, and understand God made marriage. Let's understand the institution of marriage. So verse 6, verse 6, but from the beginning, 
In contrast, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. What has God designed in marriage? God hates divorce. God made marriage. God established the participants in mar- of marriage. Verse 6, from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. What does marriage consist of? Marriage consists from creation, from the one who made man and woman, from his design, one man, one woman, period. Anything else is not marriage. Marriage depends on the participants that the creator, that the creator designed one man, one woman. Commentator William Lane makes this observation. The creation of the two sexes is resolved in unity through marriage as instituted by God. And the problem, the problems in our in our culture stem uh, the the wrong thinking about homosexuality and and LGBTQ and all of those things. It, It stems, it started from leaving the foundation and by embracing a casual view of marriage. When you start to when you start to subjective make God's word subjective, then there's no end. And we're seeing that there's no end. Right, You get back to the basics. Who made marriage? God made marriage. And because God made marriage, God determines who constitutes a married couple. One man, one woman. And God established the pattern. He established the participants. He established the pattern. Separation from father and mother. Verse 7, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. This further reinforces the man-woman structure. How has God designed society to flourish? You have mothers and fathers that have children. You have children that then leave their mothers and fathers, join together, and create a home. Simple. God establishes the pattern. You leave your father and mother, and you know that that's talking about a mindset. It doesn't have to be you have to move across the country, but it is a mindset. You can live across the country and still not leave your father and mother. No, you 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 are now a unit. Right? You don't go back crying to mommy when things don't go wrong. You are a unit. And you're a one flesh unit, and you're called to work together as a new unit. And in that statement, it's further established who you leave. You leave parents, not a former spouse. You leave parents, not a former spouse. God established the participants. He established the pattern of separation from father and mother, and he established the permanence. The two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. They leave, they cling, they hold together, and God makes them a one flesh union. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, this is, this is a mystery. How it happens, can't, don't know, but it happens because God makes it happen. You are a one flesh union, a permanent stuckness. A dear couple who's been married for thousands and thousands and thousands of weeks shared a story some time ago of perhaps the first week or two, something happening, don't know what it was, something happening, 
and one of the spouses just making the, the exclamation, oh no, we're stuck. Got it. It's a one flesh union. And it can't be separated without there being marring that takes place. God established the participants. He established the pattern. He established the permanence, a one flesh union. And that one flesh union involves the emotional aspects, the material aspects, the parental aspects, the financial aspects, the physical aspects, right? It's, It's all there. God intends for a couple to operate as a one flesh unit. And how that looks couple to couple is going to be different. But you operate together. You're not independent anymore. And it's wonderful, and it's beautiful, and it's God's design. And Jesus then declares the significance. He declares it because he's the king. Don't miss that. Jesus says, here, let's go back. Let's go back to the design. This is what God made marriage to be. Now, I'm going to make a declaration, verse 8. What? Therefore, God has joined together, let not man separate. Pharisees, you're thinking wrong. You're attempting to separate as men what God joined together. Don't do that. Man does not have the authority to tamper with God's design. Tampering with God's design never happens without consequences. Man cannot dissolve what God joins. Man can't redefine what constitutes marriage. And just the fact that something is legal, that does not equal authentication. And this has, this has bearing even, even in situations where you have a mixed marriage, where you have an unsaved spouse. We won't go there. Well, actually, we will. We'll go to one other passage in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And I go to this passage because it it emphasizes the one flesh union in marriage. Even when one spouse does not know the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, Peter addresses wives... some of whom are married to unsaved husbands. And he says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening." This is instruction to women who, you know, according to chapter 1, they've inherited all the blessings that are in Christ, and yet they're living in a home with a man who doesn't know the Lord. And Peter gently but clearly calls them, you remain in that marriage you submit to your husband. You, you fulfill the role that God has for you within that marriage. 
to the honor and glory of His name. And I love how he ends that passage when he says the, the last statement, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. I'm not a woman. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine the fear and the anxiety that would be part of a woman's life who is called to submit to an un, unsaved husband. Right? I can't imagine that. But the Holy Spirit knows. And so, in the kindness and gentleness of our God, He says, I know it's frightening, but don't fear. I'm with you. I'm with you. And to husbands, and within the context, it's likely to husbands also with unsaved wives. Verse 7 I, which I think is the most convicting verse of all in the Bible for husbands. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, whether your wife is saved or unsaved, you, you need to know her. You need to show honor to her. You need to understand her. And the reason this verse, I think, is the most convicting is because of how it ends as well, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Right? The Lord tells me as a husband, this is how I need to relate to my wife. And by not obeying the Lord's command in this, it creates a hindrance in my prayer life. That's kind of a problem because there's a lot of things I need to pray about, including being a good husband, including my children, including their church. And the Lord says that relationship with your wife and how you handle that, it's such a bond. There's such a, a, a union there in that one flesh that, that the way you handle that has a bearing on the effectiveness of your prayers. What God has joined together, let not man separate. God made marriage. Pastor Don, in quoting from his message on divorce, made this comment, marriage is for intimacy and sacrificial love. Marriage is for intimacy and sacrificial love. It's a one flesh union. And so it's pharisaical to trivialize marriage for our own personal happiness. If that's how we think, if that's how we assess our marriage on a daily basis, am I be, am I, is my spouse making me happy? We've just trivialized, trivialized it in a pharisaical manner. Responding to our spouse by shutting down or engaging in flirtatious relationships with other, others of the opposite sex that are not our spouse or withholding intimacy to punish your spouse, all of those things reflect a pharisaical spirit or reflects a spirit of someone who's trivialized marriage and doesn't, isn't, isn't submitting to the one flesh union that you are, that God made you. A marriage that's characterized by frustration, by coldness, by distance, and by disengagement violates God's design. And so we repent. We say, you know what? This is how God made marriage, and Lord, I have, I've failed. Forgive me. <laughs> Growing up, my parents would, <laughs> I don't know where they got this, but they would deal with us in a creative way sometimes when we were in a fight as siblings. It was horrible. I hated it. You know, we'd be arguing or whatever, and they'd say, all right, Nathaniel, stop. When I, you know, I would have been glad if they'd stopped there. But then they go, okay, now, go over to your sister, Rebecca, 
and take her hands, take her by the hands, you know, both hands, and say, you are my sister and I love you. Hated that. Right? I mean, you're just, you were just all upset with her and, and it felt good to be upset with her. And now I have to go walk over and say, you are my sister and I love you. Right? And I mean, and, and usually what would happen, you know, we'd walk over and you'd, and you'd start busting out laughing, you know. <laughs> you are my sister and I love you. <laughs> Don't really mean it, but I'm obeying what mom said. Well, I, I use that to say, you know what? If, if marriage characterized by frustration, coldness, distance, and disengagement, disengagement violates God's design, I, I don't know, I don't have anybody in mind when I say this, but maybe you need to go home to your spouse tonight and take him by the hands and say, you are my husband, you are my wife, and I love you. God designed marriage. And he designed it to be a sweet, joyful union. Yes, hard. Yes, having to be characterized by repentance and forgiveness because we're sinners. But in Christ, we have all the resources we need to repent and extend forgiveness and enjoy the fellowship with Christ and with one another that he intended with his design. Well, the last point, God determines consequences. God hates divorce. God made marriage, and God determines consequences. Back to Mark 10. You know, there's a lot more that could be said about those middle verses there, and there's a sense that I intentionally went quickly through them because it really is simple, too. It's very simple. Not easy, but simple. Well, the disciples, you know, this is tough for them. And so they ask him again about the matter. And Jesus again answers them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. It's very clear what Jesus is saying. Divorce and remarriage apart from the very narrow exception, divorce and remarriage constitutes adultery. And the consequences and the position, the biblical position of the consequences make it very clear that God's determination, God's determination is unpopular with the world. Again, Remember where this is taking place, under Herod's jurisdiction. And this exact thing has happened. And Jesus, Jesus is not backing down. He's saying Herodias is an adulterer and Herod is an adulterer. Right? It's, it's a loaded statement. And it's unpopular with the world. It already cost John his head. God's determination is unpopular in the world. That's why everything is legal now. That's why there's no fault divorce. Again, legalization does not equal authentication. We go by the book, God's book. God's determination is also unpopular in influential religious organizations. Just think about how the m most of professing Christianity in the West views marriage and divorce and remarriage very lightly. And it's, and it's even emphasized by the way that, that men in ministry are so quickly reinstated after vile sin in this area. God's Determination is unpopular and influential religious organization. It was, it was in Jesus' day, it is now. And God's determination is unpopular even before many Christians. Do you know how the disciples responded to Jesus' instruction in Matthew 19? I mean, the the they understood, they understood 
how significant this was because they said, well, then it's better for a man not to marry. If, if this is how strict this is, if this is God's design, it's better for a man not to marry. That was their, that was their involuntary response to what Jesus said marriage is and the consequences for divorce and remarriage. Divorce is destructive because it severs what God has joined. And divorce for unbiblical reasons by professing believers raises a high hand against God. David prayed, keep me from presumptuous sins. Well, forging ahead because we're bent on our own unbiblical happiness is to raise your hand and sin presumptuously and with a will against God's will. Which makes it a cause for church discipline. And should, if that's being pursued, cause the person to even question their own salvation, which is the purpose of church discipline, someone that carries on in their own unrepentant way. It's a sin against a high hand against God. When we view marriage as or pursue the dissolution of marriage for a personal sense of happiness, we are bowing to the idol of subjectivity in our world. We're saying, my personal feelings are more important than God's truth. And the call to discipleship, the call to Christ, is a call to bow to the King. It's a call to submit yourself to the Word of God, submit to yourself to the Lord of the Word. And joy in marriage and healing for marriage begins with accepting God's design and submitting to the authority of Christ. You know, so I, I have to say it, you, you just never know where people are. Several years ago, I used to direct an annual couples retreat, and one year we put a survey out. One of the speakers wanted a survey, and one of the, one of the questions that came back was, we're about ready to end our marriage, and this is our last hope. <laughs> which is really sad that they're coming to a marriage conference. I don't know why they didn't go to their church leaders. But you just never know where people are. So with that in mind, and with what we've looked at, you know, if, if in your mind and heart you're thinking, you know, I've got to get out, I'm going to get, and pursuing to get out of my marriage, folks, can I say to you, no, I'm not going to ask, I'm going to say to you, on the authority of the Word of God, on the authority of what Christ said, don't stop. Obey. Submit to your King. Jesus' authority over the home, over marriage, rightly understood, drives everyone to Christ in repentance and dependence on Him. And that's your answer. Your answer isn't to get out. Your answer is to run to Christ. Your answer is to find the fullness of happiness and joy and satisfaction in the Lord. Our call to, as wives submit to our husbands, as husbands love our wives, is not dependent on if the other one is fulfilling their role. Our call to those roles and our call to obedience is independent of what the other spouse is doing and dependent only on what Christ has called us to do. It's looking beyond the person to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, I, whatever the response is, I love my Lord and I'm serving Him. And so whether you are in a hard marriage or dealing with the consequences of past sinful decisions, you, you need Christ. Or in a good marriage, you need Christ. Or wanting to get married, you need Christ. Ultimately, marriage to the glory of God takes place only as you are 
in Christ and filled with the Spirit of God. You know, I want to take more time, but we're, we're out tonight. Uh, so let me just let me just refer this to you for your own consideration. In the passages and the epistles that deal with marriage, Ephesians, Colossians, 1 Peter, Hebrews, 1 Corinthians, those are not standalone passages. All those passages that deal with marriage and deal with role in marriage are connected to your life in Christ. And so when, when you have those instructions, the, the obedience and the fulfillment of, of that is a direct result of the life of Christ in you, working itself out. And that's the only way it can happen. And it's a joy when by the Spirit of God we, are, we obey and we're filled with the Spirit and the filling of the Spirit comes out in obeying the Lord and the roles that He's called us to in our marriage. You know, you know, being filled with the Spirit isn't running up and down the aisles in a church. Being filled with the Spirit is going home and, and cultivating a godly marriage. So submitting to Christ in the matter of marriage is following Christ. And married couples, as you cultivate your one flesh union day in and day out, you are fulfilling what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Don't minimize an evening at home with your spouse. That's following Christ. Right? Be more concerned if that prospect scares you. Now we're called to live in this one flesh union. Well, as I close tonight, I'm going to read an extended quote from one of the commentators that I frequently find helpful, James Edwards. I think he summarizes this passage so well. Jesus does not conceive of marriage on the grounds of its dissolution, but on the grounds of its architectural design and purpose of God. Human failure does not alter that purpose. The intent of Jesus' teaching is not to shackle those who fail in marriage with debilitating guilt. The question is not whether God forgives those who fail in marriage. The answer to that question is assured in 328. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. There is, after all, no instance in Scripture of an individual seeking forgiveness and being denied it by God. The question in our day of impermanent commitments and casual divorce is whether we as Christians will hear the unique call of Christ to discipleship and marriage. In marriage, as in other areas to which the call of Christ applies, will we seek relief in what is permitted or commit ourselves to what is intended by God and commanded by Christ? Will we fall away in trouble and difficulty or follow Jesus in the costly journey of discipleship even in marriage? Will we sunder the divine union of who become one flesh or will we honor and nurture marriage as a gift and creation of God? Well, may the Lord give us His grace to live to the honor of His name. Father, we come to you this evening recognizing our absolute dependence upon you in every way. We come to a passage like this. We see your standard of righteousness. We recognize how far short we fall of it. And yet we are reminded of the perfection of Christ's sacrifice. And we rejoice that all our sins are cleansed in Him as we confess them and find forgiveness in Him. We rejoice in that. So Lord, give us Your grace to walk in obedience to our King to find joy in what you have designed, 
to love our spouses with the same kind of self-sacrificing love that Christ has for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening from Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. You can find more church information and other helpful materials at thetruthpulpit.com, teaching God's people God's Word. This message is copyrighted, all rights reserved.